Uh, Paul said it doesn't exist. Winnie said it's not called Plateau. And so I'm now going to try and tell you how to manage something that doesn't exist and isn't called this. So, um, yeah, well, well, welcome to the witching hour of, of, of ten past six when everybody wants to get on and have a drink. Um, so, firstly, which Plateau Iris? Um, we, we've heard a huge amount about diagnosis. We've heard a huge amount about imaging, uh, uh, whether or not it's a, a ciliary process position and peripheral iris thickness and peripheral iris position, insertion of the iris. Um, the first thing to say is that not all post-PI iridotrabecular contact is plateau. We've heard about that from the lens, um, at the discussion about the lens mechanism involvement of lens, and I think that's crucially important. I'm going to try and restrict myself here to, those, to, the, to the management of those individuals in which we hypothesize from our clinical examination um, that there is a less of a contribution from the lens itself uh, because in those individuals I think it's quite clear that we should probably just be simply removing the lens. Um, how many truly distinct entities do we face? Uh, Winnie uh, would like to consider most of these in one group. Um, whether it turns, depends whether you're a splitter or a lumper, I think, in a classification terms, and I would tend to split those up into a number of different distinct entities. But the important question for that is whether or not it is actually going to be something that affects our treatment decisions. Because in the end, we're all clinicians, and we, wanna, we want to treat patients and have something that's going to help guide us. So the, the, and the final question, really, is what's the effect of race? And I think we have to be crucially careful, exquisitely careful, uh, in how we interpret a lot of the evidence we've heard today already um, in terms of what population is, uh, or the, are those data being drawn Sorry, what population are those data being gathered in? Because it's quite clear, Paul's shown that there are distinct differences in the behavior of Mongolians from Singapore Chinese, which are largely Han Chinese and Southern Chinese, um, and they're all East Asians. They are going to be very, very different from blue-eyed Caucasians in, in, in Iceland, say. We have to be, I think, have our, really have our wits about us uh, and not be um, lulled into falsely extrapolating from one group to the other simply because there's a paucity of general evidence. So those are sort of the caveats aside. Um, uh, the caveats really for what I'm going to talk about um, for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, effects of race are clearly going to be on the underlying anatomy. Iris characteristics are a very thick, um, somewhat more rigid irises in irides in the Chinese. Uh, possibly treatment response. We've seen this slide, or at least this paper referred to already, with definitions of, of, of what some would consider to be plateau. Um, Tin and his group, along with Prin in um, Bangkok, uh, required each one of these characteristics to be present clinically and on UBM for them to consider that individual had what they were calling plateau and came up with a figure of around 30% of their angle closures. And we've talked about mechanism. I'm only showing these not to talk about, dis to discuss the mechanisms that Winnie's covered so nicely already, but simply to say if we have got two different groups where you have got uh, a contribution from anterior placed iris processes and that's giving you contact and anterior rotation and you've got a gonioscopic configuration and you've got another group with no contact, posteriorly positioned processes, um, which is probably the more, the more normal, or certainly closer to the average, and you've still got a similar gonioscopic appearance, do you, do we, should we be trying to distinguish between the two of those somehow clinically, and are they going to um, behave differently if we start firing lasers at them or poisoning them with pilocarpin? We don't know because the studies haven't been done, uh, so this is one of those, well, it's an evidence-free or an evidence-light zone talks where I, w I have to say that we don't have... RCTs to try and distinguish the treatment effects with these two groups. And I think that's a nice piece of uh, investigation, nice, some nice studies that would only require probably some relatively small numbers of patients to start trying to tease that apart. And it would be nice to see if we could, defining these groups on the basis of these two configurations of the position of the iris, try to start to see if we can tease apart some different responses to treatment. So the principles of managing angle closure generally um, apply to this. 
Well, firstly, we've had to remove the risk of acute angle closure for all of these groups because we've had to do a PI to be able to diagnose post-PI iridotrabecular contact, which is what we're talking about. We would like, then, to preserve any remaining trabecular meshwork fun function, if only we knew how, and obviously we're going to treat the raised IOP because that's what we do. To do that, it would be nice to restore the non-pathological anatomical relationships in the anterior segment, and if possible, resolve or remove any of that residual iridotrabecular contact. We're going to relieve pupil block, as I've said, and treat those non-pupil block mechanisms of closure. But just to pause briefly here, um, the Sohota work and the histology work that Paul referred to earlier, which is very, very elegant work of trabecular blocks, and hopefully will be shortly be, um, uh, there's, there's a suggestion that it will be repeated um, and confirmed in a Japanese group that presented at Arvo last year, although they've not yet published, showing that you can get histological damage to trabecular meshwork from appositional contact alone does not mean that you're going to get histological damage and functional damage to your trabecular meshwork from appositional closure alone. And I think that at uh, that point, we then have to diverge in our opinions as to what we're actually going to do for these individuals. Because if you believe that damage is inevitable, then you are going to think that you have to treat that iridotrabecular contact in all individuals. And therefore, you're an interventionist and we should be firing lasers at everybody with potentially firing lasers or pilocarpin or taking the lenses out, whatever our treatment options are. But if you acknowledge or, 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 or believe that appositional contact in a large number of individuals is not necessarily inevitably going to lead to problems, then you may wish to be more cautious in your approach to sit back, to watch what's going to happen to the individual and to treat them as and when they have raised pressure later on in their disease. And a straw poll of a handful of people over the last few months talking about do you actually do iridoplasty for these guys gives you a pretty much what, as wide a spread as you can get of opinion as to what you should do. There are those who will, who will almost never do an iridoplasty to people, and there are those who will say any iridotrabecular contact is pathological. It's an abnormal anatomy, and I'm going to go in there and treat it. And that's because we've got an evidence-free zone, as I said. So, watchful waiting masterful inactivity, all those wonderful terms that we learned at medical school for doing nothing but in a sort of intelligent way. <laughs> IOP treatments alone, that's one version, treat the IOP and nothing else. Or angle interventions, medicines, laser and surgery. Well, we've got the standard medical treatments for um, targeting IOP that we know so well. Pilocarpin, as a, not as a pressure lowering treatment, but as an angle modifying treatment, may be possibly more tolerated, better tolerated, because you can use lower concentrations. When the angle is your therapeutic target, you can sort of reset the um, intensity or, or strength that you may need. But it remains poorly tolerated in the young, and of course there are long-term side effects from use, um, such as cataract and a persistently um, myosed pupil. Some people like pilogel, some people don't. Argon laser iridoplasty, popularized um, by Bob Rich, of whose um, papers we've heard referred to and whose um, images we've seen some of this afternoon um, certainly works very well in some and we'll see a bit more later and then lens extraction um, and I've learned a great deal from Paul's um, extensive experience in the high hyper ropes uh, firstly beware the for refractive surprise be careful with the pre presbyopes because there's really unhappy campers if you start taking out um, the, uh, lenses from individuals who are relying on a lot of their accommodation and then leave the hyperopes just plus. So iridoplasty or lens extraction in terms of intervention are doing slightly different things, but they will both open up the angle. There's a caveat with some of these individuals who've got a plateau-type <coughs> problem going on is that not all of them will open up, even after a lens extraction. Um, most of them will, but not all. Bob Rich did a nice series that he gathered over many years, and therefore is clearly not all of those individuals that he was taking their lenses out but he did manage to find a significant number for whom there was relatively little angle opening despite lens extraction. So it's not necessarily going to be the um, cure-all for everyone. Iridoplasty will thin your peripheral iris with acutely with some acute uh, uh, um, protein contraction with a thermal burn, and then hopefully around that there will be a persistent, prolonged um, uh, pulling away of the peripheral iris from the angle, 
And again, from um, Paul's clinic um, here at Moorfields, there's uh, retrospective data showing reduced intraocular pressure, angle opening, angle widening from a very large series of iridoplasty, but it is not an entirely benign intervention. You are firing an argon laser at the peripheral iris, generating a lot of inflammation, and if they've got PAS, you can make it worse. Lens extraction will treat more than just the angle opening. You'll also remove their lens opacity if they have some, obviously. You may also be retreating, sorry, may also be treating their refraction. And somebody who's been a lifelong high hyperope in thick glasses and called Specky all their life may well love you at their next clinic when you actually get them out of glasses. And it may prevent long-term trabecular meshwork damage and there is, you know, the longitudinal data on that. Hopefully some information will come out of the EAGLE trial, which um, I'm sure many people in the room are recruiting to. But you've got to consider there's a significant amount of surgical risk. There's also the loss of accommodation. And with into, the, into the mix of that, when you're trying to decide, we've got to throw in what are the laser risks for um, our other treatments. So when to treat plateau iris, if you'll still let me use the term plateau, um, I, I like to consider and put these all into the mix the severity of the iridotrabecular contact, so that's height and extent. If you've got, a, if you've got low plateau, which is just touching the, uh, the more posterior trabecular meshwork and that alone, without any evidence of in, intraocular pressure rise, or if it's not extending through the full 360 degrees, I'm much more likely to observe that. The extent of any PAS will restrict your treatment options because the PAS may well get worse after an iridoplasty because of the associated, presumably because of the associated inflammation. Do they have raised IOP at the time? Have they had acute attacks of post-PI raised pressure, as Winnie alluded to? I think that will readily lower, lower our threshold for some form of definitive intervention. What's the severity of their glaucoma to soft neuropathy? Are they phakic? And do they have a clear lens? Because clearly, if they've got a cataract, if there's even a whisper of lens opacity, a whiff of cataract will come out. Age, refraction. So the plateau questions, um, I don't think that these are going to be as long-lasting as the foster questions of gonioscopy, but they're just something to think about in this context. Does the IOP itself need treating, or can you just watch them? Is it safe to just observe them? I think it takes, in a sense, more strength of will and force of medical character to do nothing. It's much easier to do something. Does the abnormal, abnormal anatomy need treating? It may not do. There are an awful lot of, if, if 30 to 50% of primary angle closure suspects from some of the previous papers in China have got residual iridotrabecular contact, the conversion, the event rate of those individuals converting to um, raised pressure and glaucoma is probably not going to be high enough to justify treating every one of them. Might the resolution of iridotrabecular contact actually improve any IOP control at the time or later? And might resolution of iridotrabecular contact preserve long-term trabecular meshwork function, which is ultimately what we are aiming to do in angle closure as a predominantly anterior segment disease. So these are suggestions. They can only be suggestions rather than recommendations any stronger than that, simply because it's an evidence light zone. So I would say we should watch limited plateau, or what I'm going to call mild plateau. Um, consider for iridoplasty those with extensive plateaus. So if someone does have 360 degrees of iridotrabecular contact completely obscuring their trabecular meshwork, I would probably perform an iridoplasty, but not all of us in the audience who manage a lot of angle closure would. Iridoplasty, iridoplasty for plateau with raised intraocular pressure, unless there's PAS. FACO, if you've got an excuse for it, and trial of pyocarpine before clear lens extraction, because at least if you try the pyocarpine, they know that you've tried everything and they know how unpleasant pilocarping can be. And every now and again, you'll have a pleasant surprise, and somebody will say, no, I don't mind this at all. That angle will open up nicely, and you can leave them on it. So just to leave us with a, a couple of thoughts, I think that non-pupil block mechanisms are important and are probably one of the areas where we um, have less evidence than the rest of angle closure um, and considerations. We are trained... Um, to, and constrained by our thinking about pupil block because of our training. We need to try and get away from that somehow. 
A lot of the talk has been about risk factors, iris, iris volumes, iris behaviors. Those are, those are fascinating and will be important for prediction, but at the end of the day, when you've already done the PI and the patient's sitting in front of you and they've got a residual closed angle, we've got to work out what to do with those, and there are more of them, more of them than we realize. It's an evidence light zone, so that's a challenge to us all to get some evidence. And in summary, I think we should always treat the pressure in these guys and we need to consider the anatomy and then make a, a, an informed best guess. Thanks very much.